kind of a mystery. The dictionary says it's an eager desire for distinction, power, or fame. But what does that really mean? Well, let's start with the word eager. All by itself, eager is kind of exciting. Kids are eager for their birthday parties. They expect to be the center of attention, get lots of presents, eat too much. I guess grown-ups are eager for birthdays, too. Unless, of course, they're embarrassed that the number of candles on the cake outnumber their achievements. But we can be eager to see a ball game, eager to see our kids in a dance recital, eager to see an old friend, eager to shop for a new car. Eager sounds like a lot of fun. But do you ever hear people say they are eager to live a better life, eager to have a better family, eager to make a lot of money? Probably not. And that's a problem. Because how I see it, living a better life, having a better family, and making a lot of money takes an eager desire. We have the remarkable ability to get exactly what we must have. But there is a difference between wishes and desires. We've all heard people say, Oh, I wish I could just drop five pounds. I want to be a little lighter. And we've probably said it ourselves, especially after a big holiday dinner of turkey and homemade pie and every other thing we can possibly stuff ourselves with in one eight-hour period of time. And even though we may wish we could breathe a little easier in our clothing, we have to have the desire to exercise a little more and eat a little less. The I wish I could lose weight has to become, I have the eager desire to lose weight. I'm also sure you've heard people talk about wishing they had more money to pay the bills, or take a vacation, or just to take a little pressure off of life. But before their lifestyle can change, their wish needs to become a desire. If they really desired change, they wouldn't spend their evenings just watching TV and wishing they were doing something more. The backbone of an eager desire to change is discipline. True ambition is disciplined, eager desire. It's that little part within us that says, if I want to be ready for that meeting tomorrow, I need to finish preparing for it today. If I want to make sure I can pay for my kid's college education, I need to start saving today. If I want a better life tomorrow, I need to start working on it today. Ambition is a minute-by-minute, day-by-day mentality. To have the ambition to work towards a better family life, a newer car, a bigger house, a financially secure future, you have to live it every moment. If living a successful life was easy, I'm sure more people would be successful. If just being ambitious was enough, I'm sure all of the broke and perplexed people in the world wouldn't be broke and perplexed. While most people spend most of their lives struggling to earn a living, a much smaller number seem to have everything going their way. Instead of just earning a living, the smaller group is busily working at building and enjoying a fortune. Everything just seems to work out for them. And here sits the much larger group, wondering in awe on how life can be so unfair, complicated, and unjust. So what's the major difference between the little group with so much and the larger group with so little? Despite all the factors that affect our lives, like the kind of parents we have, the schools we attended, the part of the country we grew up in, none has as much potential power for doing good as the ability to dream. Dreams are a projection of the kind of life we want to lead. Dreams can drive you. Dreams can make you skip over obstacles. When we allow our dreams to pull us, they unleash a creative force that can overpower everything in our way. To unleash this power, though, your dreams must be well-defined. A fuzzy future has little pull power. Well-defined dreams are not fuzzy. Wishes are fuzzy. To really achieve your dreams, to really have your future plans pull you, your dreams must be vivid. 
If you've ever hiked a 14,000-foot peak in the Rocky Mountains, one thought has surely come to mind. How did the settlers of this country do it? How did they get from the East Coast to the West Coast? By foot. Carrying one day's supply of food and water is hard enough. Can you imagine hauling all of your worldly goods with you? Mile after mile, day after day, month after month? These people had dreams, big ones. They had ambition. They didn't focus on the hardship of getting up the mountain. In their minds, they were already on the other side. Their bodies just hadn't gotten them there yet. Despite all of their pains and struggles, births and deaths along the way, those who made it to the other side had a single vision, to reach the land of continuous sunshine and extraordinary wealth, to start over where anything was possible, where everything was possible. Their dreams were stronger than the obstacles in their way. You've got to be a dreamer. You've got to see the future finished in advance. You've got to see California while you're climbing 14,000-foot peaks. You've got to see the finish line while you're running the race. You've got to hear the cheers when you're in the middle of a monster project. And you've got to be willing to put yourself through the paces of doing the uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. Because that's how you realize your dreams. Our great country was founded with dreams. They've always been important. Dreams are what caused thousands of people to leave their homes and families and start over in a land where anything was possible. To this day, dreams continue to bring people to our land of opportunity, to a country where you can start with little and end up with a lot, to America. Don't you sometimes wonder why so many immigrants who come to America can build a new life and a fortune while many of the people who were born here are barely surviving? They have a dream, a defined goal, ambition. Aside from the pioneers that crossed the prairies and the mountains to reach their vision of hope and future promises, there are other amazing examples of how ambition has shaped America. Take Ben Franklin, for instance. When most people think of Ben Franklin, they remember the kite and the lightning bolt and the discovery of electricity. What a lot of people may not know is that Ben Franklin was one of the first writers to address self-making. When Franklin started Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, he used the blank spaces between the crop data and the weather information to insert clever bits of moral and practical advice. I'm sure you've heard the saying, fish and company start to stink in three days. Well, that was one of hundreds of Ben Franklin's comments on life. Another was, diligence is the mother of good luck. You know, it's amazing how hard-working, smart-working people have all the luck. We sometimes hear of a brand new musical group, an overnight success. They must have been in the right place at the right time, knew the right people, had a friend to help them out. But if you've ever watched an interview with some of these folks, you'll probably hear that their overnight success took several years. Diligence is the mother of good luck. Now, in addition to these witticisms, Ben Franklin gave us three principles of success and ambition that have withstood the test of time. Number one, happiness doesn't come from big pieces of great success, but from small advantages hammered out day by day. What Mr. Franklin is saying here is that we must be happy with what we've got when we're in pursuit of what we want. Too often we say, oh, I'll be happy when I just get that promotion. I'll be happy when I just land that contract. I'll be happy when I just have more money. I'll be happy when I just, just what? You won't be any happier when you reach your goals than you are right now. It just doesn't work that way. Abraham Lincoln said it best. He said, you'll be as happy as you make up your mind to be. Right now, whether you're on your way, whether you've already gotten there, you'll be as happy as you make up your mind to be now.